All right, so this one here is going to be about sin. And we know that the Lord loses not one of his sheep. We know that the Lord has ordained all things from the foundation of the world and that your salvation is a calling. Goats are born goats. Sheep are born sheep, but sheep are born lost. And I prepped a lot of Bible verses, but I guess that's one we can add since I already had the Zoom thing pulled up, which I no longer need. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus only came for the lost sheep of the church. Remember, Israel is no longer that land over there. Not the true Israel, because Israel is the church, and the church is Israel. We are grafted in Jews. That's why the Bible refers to us, or his word refers to us as grafted in Jews in Romans. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments. That's Acts 7.38. Who received the Ten Commandments? Well, Israel did, right? That's the Old Testament days. But notice, we believe Luke wrote um, the book of Acts. Notice that it's referred to as the church. Okay? So, Israel is the church and the church is Israel. And Jesus said, I only came for the lost sheep of the church. That's who he came for. That's all who he came for. So what we're going over today is sin. And there's two types of sin. There's the sin that you're never going to quite fully get rid of. And there's the sin that the Lord will purge out of you. Because he has to. Why does he have to? For whom he did foreknow, foreknew when? Well, at the foundation of the world. According as he have chosen us in him before, excuse me, not at the, before the foundation of the world. See, God knew his family from the beginning. That's why not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, have we prophesied in your name and done many wonderful works in your name and cast out demons in your name. And Jesus says, I will say unto them, I never knew you. So he either knows you or he's going to say, I have never known you. He either knows you or he doesn't. If he knows you, then you are the predestinated chosen few sheep of the narrow way that few find. And the Lord, there always has been a chosen people group, folks. In the Old Testament, that was known as Israel, the bloodline nation state. Now it is known as the grafted in Israel. And there are some true, true, true Jews, but they don't take part in any of that political Zionism that's going on over there uh, in the land where Jesus roamed. They got a pyramid with an all seeing eye on top of their Supreme Court over there. Tel Aviv is as liberal as San Francisco. Revelation 11.8 says it's spiritually Sodom and Egypt. I just explained how it is Sodom and Egypt already. And um, of course it is. That's what it was put there for, where the Antichrist will declare himself to be God. It is the great city of Babylon now. <clears throat> so, you know, God's promises to Abraham, oh, we're supposed to look out for Israel. No, you're supposed to look out for the church, the true Israel. Because God's promises to Abraham have been fulfilled Read Galatians 3.16 and Galatians 3.29. So, according as he have chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. In Isaiah 46.10, declaring the end from the beginning, declaring revelation from Genesis. From ancient times are the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, I will do my pleasure. God has already declared all things, who his sheep are, who his goats are. 
again, before the foundation of the world, you're already declared. That's why Paul said, what was it Paul said? Um, when I was cut from my mother's womb and called by his grace. I can never remember where Here's that. a summary from Bible, King James Version. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. And they glorified God in me. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me. So he's saying, when he was born, he was already under grace. Now Paul, what? Went on to kill Christians. Until when? Until he received the calling. Jesus called him. Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul, why dost thou pers persecute me so? Or something like that. So, until you get the calling, the Lord's going to call you from all of your deadly sins we will call them and whatever the seven deadly sins are that don't that's not biblical at all like if i were to say uh what are the seven deadly sins according to britannica thomas aquinas they are vainglory or pride greed or covetousness lust or inordinate or illicit sexual desire envy gluttony which is usually understood to include drunkenness wrath or anger and sloth Okay, watch this. Seven deadly sins, Bible verse. There is none. What are the seven deadly sins, Bible info? I see a list, I don't see no Bible verses. So the Bible speaks about lust in Timothy. Sure it does. The Bible also mentions in the following verses, Matthew, blah, blah, blah. Gluttony. Gluttony is excessive ongoing eating of food or drink. First, First Corinthians says, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all in the glory of God. Does that mean if you overeat? See, the Bible verse there says nothing about gluttony. Not at all. So notice how sloth, sloth of excessive laziness or failure to act and utilize one's talents. The Bible also mentions sloth in the following verses, Proverbs, Proverbs, Romans. Let's go to Romans 12. <clears throat> Romans 12. See if we get this word sloth in there. Because remember, it's saying what? Sloth is excessive laziness and failure to act. Is there only seven deadly? Not slothful in business. For, well, it does say the word slothful. There you go. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing. So not slothful in business, not lazy in business. You see where they've taken Bible verses and turned them into something they called seven deadly sins. We're going to go over what the real deadly sins are today, folks. Let's just go over them now. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lavaciousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, reveling. Reveling would, you know, party, let's get on top of the bar, do shots, whatever, you know, such a like, which things I tell you before, as I've told you in times past, that which do, this is, this is key, those that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom. Now, are you going to be making a free will decision to come out of all that? No. Absolutely not. No, it is actually God that will beat that out of you. God will beat 
the real deadly sins out of you. For whom the Lord loveth, he will lock you down and he will beat every son whom he receiveth. For whom the Lord loveth. Well, I thought he loved the whole world. Nope. John 3, 16, falsely translated. Uh, for God so loved cosmos was actually what it was in the Greek. And the first definition of cosmos is harmonious arrangement. Well, what is that? Uh, choosing his sheep at the foundation of the world. We just went over that. Erasmus, a Catholic who believed in free will, believed the Bible spoke about free will, used the fifth definition on down, the inhabitants of the earth. And of course, we find out that is not what he meant. Jesus said, I only came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And Jesus loses not one of his sheep. So is the whole world saved? Because John... 639 clearly tells you he loses not one. This is the Father's will which have sent me, that which he hath given me, when folks, given when, at the foundation of the world. Given me, I should lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. So it being what? The church. And you go down to verse 44. No man can come unto me except the Father which have sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up on the last day. 65, and he said, therefore, I said unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Which was established at the foundation of the world. And like Paul said, when I was cut from my mother's womb. So you understand this process, right? You're under grace the day you're born because you're his. And they never teach you that concerning the, what real grace is. Making a free will decision is a work. They've lied to you. For by grace, but God choosing you at the foundation of the world, you are saved through faith. What is faith? Faith comes by hearing. Or I shouldn't say, what is faith? Because there's another Bible verse that describes faith. But how do you get your faith? The Bible verse says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In the seeing eye and the hearing ear, even the Lord have made both. And did he make it at the foundation of the world? He gave you the seeing eye and the hearing ear. So by grace, you're saved through faith. Faith comes by what? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Jesus said what? My sheep hear my voice. Hear 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 my voice faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god the seeing eye and the hearing ear even the lord have made both faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god jesus said my sheep jesus by the way is the word of god in the beginning was the word the word was with god and the word was god and then the word was made flesh 13 verses later John chapter 1, and Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, right? My sheep hear my voice. So for grace you are saved through hearing Jesus' voice. It is not of yourselves. You will get the call. And when he calls you, he turns you. Let's come back to this, but let's interrupt for a second. For whom he did foreknow at the foundation of the world, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So that's what's going to take place. You're going to be being conformed to his image. He's going to slowly beat the world out of you that he might be firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he does predestinate. Now, this is the process. You're chosen at the foundation of the world. So whom he did predestinate that you're choosing at the foundation of the world. For whom he did predestinate them he also called. And that's the next process. You get the calling. And then those that he predestinated also get justified. You're like, no, it's not who got, were predestinated. It was who called gets just, no. But those who called 
we're also predestinated. This is all one and the same. This is all one group. If you're part of the predestinated at the foundation of the world, by proxy, you're going to get the call. By proxy, you will go through the sanctification process known as being justified or justification. And by proxy, you will also receive your glorified body at the end. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So it's a start to finish job that Jesus does. How does he do that? Well, whom the Lord loveth, which is his church, he will lock you down. He will chasten and, and beat you, scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure this chastening, God is dealing with you as a son for whom, um, for what son would the father not truly lock down and correct? But if you be without this chastisement, where all of God's sheep are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. It just says all, but of course, the Bible is cryptically written. It is sheep talking to sheep. That isn't talking about the whole world. Or else the whole world is saved. And we clearly know that it's a narrow way and few be that find it. So, For by grace you are saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is not of any free will decision that you're making. It is the gift of God, which was what? Given at the foundation of the world. It is not of your works. So repenting or making a free will decision, it's not of your works. Okay. Why does it keep popping up? You must be logged in to save notes. I'm not, whatever. Okay, lest any man should boast. And people will boast. They'll go, well, I know I'm saved. I made a free will decision for Jesus. Okay, that's all well and good. Sorry, doesn't work like that. For we are his workmanship. Really? From the foundation of the world? No? Created in Christ Jesus. When? At the foundation of the world. Unto the good works, which God have before ordained. When? At the foundation of the world that we should walk in them. And if you forgot the foundation of the world Bible verse, according as he have chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us Remember, those that are predestinated are called, and those that are called are justified, and those that are justified are glorified. Having, in other words, giving us the process to receive our glorified bodies because we were adopted of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. All taking place at the foundation of the world. There is no free will decision. The Bible actually tells you it is not a free will. In Romans... 9, 11 through 24, Paul is actually explaining the fairness of this, because it doesn't sound fair, does it? What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Because it doesn't sound fair, does it? Sure doesn't. But actually, Paul explains that it is. So it is not of him that willeth, nor him that runneth, but God that showeth mercy. It is not of your free will. In the New Living, they actually explain it. In very, very, very specific terms. So it is God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose it nor work for it. You can't choose it, folks. You can't willeth it. For children not yet born, neither having done any good or evil. So it's before they're born, before they've done anything bad. It's all about the purpose of God according to election that might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Election. 
when you look up the word elect or election, the purpose of God according to election might stand, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, that the purpose of God according to the act of him choosing you might stand, that the purpose of God according to him choosing you might stand, that the purpose of God according to the act of God's free will, by which before the foundation of the world, he decreed his blessings to certain persons. That the purpose of God, according to him picking and choosing you at the foundation of the world might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Starting to get the picture. What about the word elect itself? Picked out, chosen, chosen by God to obtain salvation through Christ. Christians are called chosen or elect of God. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. <laughs> so that's why Jesus said, ye believe me not because ye are not my sheep. Ye believe me not because ye were not chosen by God at the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. Ye were not chosen to be, to be predestinated unto the uh, children of Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will. You were not. You were not. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice because I give them this, the, hear, the, the hearing ear. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, even the Lord have made both. And I give unto them eternal life. Now, does that mean you just can just sin all you want? And No. This is what this is about today. The Lord will beat the world out of you through the chastening and scourging process. For whom the Lord loveth, he will chase and scourge of every son whom he receiveth. If you be without this chastisement, then you're a bastard, not a son. Seriously. That's also your what? This is you getting called from the world. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. We just got through reading that in the grace passage. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto the good works, which God hath before ordained that we walk in them. Ordained when? At the foundation of the world. If the world hate you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would, would love its own. But because you are not of the world, I have chosen you, chosen you, chosen you, chosen you. Out of the world. He has chosen you out of the world. The world hate of you. Does God love the whole world? Absolutely not. John 3 16 is a false translation. I teach that nonstop, nonstop, nonstop. Go to my playlist, playlist, no free will. John 3 16, falsely written and taught the word Jesus. It'll give you four. John 3, 16, false doctrine explained. Free will is a lie. Tricky Bible verses explained. Free will equals Catholicism. Erasmus is who transcripts. See, Textus Receptus, the received text. Erasmus. See that word right there? Erasmus. He's the one that wrote it. He was Catholic. Erasmus was Catholic. He believed in free will. Martin Luther and Erasmus argued and fought. You can find books on Amazon where uh, Martin Luther, who began the protest movement, Protestant Reformation it's known as, um, fought over the doctrine of free will. Erasmus is the one who transcribed the original Greek over to the Hebrew. He loved free will, and that's what was used. It's called the Received Text or Textus Receptus, and when you click that link, it will show you that that's what was used to write the King James Bible. And of course, a nefarious uh, secret society member named Sir Francis Bacon 
had the final write-off on the King James Bible. Now, the Lord ordained every bit of that. Why? Because the Lord wanted the Bible to be cryptically written because Jesus cryptically spoke. He spoke in parables. And the apostle said, why dost thou speak it to them in parables? And he said, for them it is not meant to know the kingdoms, the mystery of the kingdoms, but for you it is. Plain and simple. Who's meant to know the truth? The sheep. That's it. Jesus said, I only came for the lost sheep at the house for Israel. That's it. So who gets pulled out of this? The sheep do. They'll get the call. But what about where it says we never stop sinning? How does that work? Very important that you understand this. And we'll look at it in two different translations. All wicked actions are sin, but not every sin leads to death. All unrighteousness is sin, but there is a sin not unto death. So it, here it's said sin singular over here in the weaker, more watered down translation, but sometimes a little more exact, just like I showed you where it said um, not every, it, it, so then it's not of him that willeth nor him that runneth but God that show of mercy, it gets more exact when it, in the new living where it says you can either choose it nor work for it. And I like it better in the new living the, as far as explaining the truth. Not every sin leads to death. Okay. Now these will be one sin singular and that it would be encompassed as far as your sense of self. You know, I mean, you never, ever quite lose that sense of self, selfishness. Um, the Lord will beat enough pride out of you to where you'll be conformed to the image of his son, but you never completely lose all senses of self. So, you know, wanting to look good, looking in the mirror, wearing a certain outfit to look good. Is that something Jesus would do? Nope, so it's a sin. Sin is something Jesus would not do. That's why not every sin leads to death. We went over the deadly sins, uh, fornication, adultery, lavaciousness, so on and so forth. Um, when it talked about strife, one of them, it's arguing and bickering, hatred. So the Lord will pull you out of all that if you're his, but not every single thing that you do that isn't perfect in Jesus will lead you to death. You will repent. You will be called out of the deadly sins. Yes, of course you will, but not every sin leads to death. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, the strife, that's the fighting, the bickering. Stop it. Those people that are addicted to Donald Trump and QAnon and all that, they can't stop. They can't stop. They hate the Democrat. They don't realize that the Democrats <laughs> are being set up to look like the evil bad. Right now they're exposing all this evil from the liberal communism, uh, satanic world, and they're leading you to the false light. That's all Trump is, is the false light. When you go to, when you look at Trump on this coin, and I need to rename this so I can find it easier. Sand. sand. Oh, I got it up there. Coin sand, coin Sanhedrin. Already did then, didn't I? Let's 
War of the Sons of Light against the Sons of Darkness. That's why the black and white checkered flooring is one of the Illuminati's symbolism because it's the light and the dark. And they create a synthesis for Satan. Trump is the false light. He is seen as the good guy right now by many or most, but you know, all those that love him. Of course, Trump is also on the temple coin, which is where what? Where the Antichrist declares himself to be God standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation. So wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, reveling. Just ask those Trump QAnon followers, are they coming out of fornication? Are they still having unmarried sex? I know Trump folks that are. And they claim John 3.16 saves them and they're covered by grace. They don't even understand that grace is God choosing them at the foundation of the world. They just go by the false churches, period. That's the way it is. So I'm not sure what I'm going to name this. What was it that I was, why did I pull this up? For which cause we faint not, but through the outward man perish. Yes. There's the inner man and the outer man, and the outer man is your flesh, and the inner man is Christ in you. So the inner man cannot sin, and the outer man never stops sinning. Um, Ephesians 3.16, that we would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, be strengthened with the might of the spirit of the inner man which is Christ in us. Let me, uh, there's one more in Romans. Let me find it so I don't uh, make this long. Yeah, I'm glad I found this or I would have had to have done a part two because this is actually very important. Now then, by the way, Romans 7 is the conflict Paul talks about as far as his sinful body, his sinful nature. But you do see the Lord will beat the world out of you. But what, when in Romans 7, he's talking about the, the difficulty of our sinful nature and how we never stop truly any of it and how he can't wait to get out of this body. But of course, it's, it's the pride, the pride of life and those things or the sense of self and uh, things that you will stop doing. Um, so now then, it is no more that I do it, but it's sin that dwelleth in me. Okay. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to, to perform that which is good, I find not. Of course, the Holy Spirit does beat the world out of you. So, But he, he's telling a story. That's why they, they use this um, passage in this chapter to try to teach that you don't need to repent. And it's ridiculous. Jesus was clear. Um, that you must repent. I guess I should, and that's what is that? The repenting is the justification process that you go through. That's the repentant, that's the sanctification process. It's not a one time deal, it's a process. So, hang on, I forgot where I was taking you now. Since I was, hang on, I have no idea where I was going. I can't remember. Sorry, but let's keep going. <clears throat> And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. In other words, he's not perfect. He's never perfect. That sense of self, that little bit of anger, you know, sometimes you lose your temper. That kind of stuff is never going to leave you. But he's saying he, that, he, that he hates it, that he hates his flesh. I want to, I want to do what is good. In other words, what he... I want to live perfectly like Jesus. Of course, you're never going to be able to. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, am I really the one doing wrong? It is sin living in me. Yes, because you're born in a sinful body. Of course, the Lord will come into you at the calling. And through the justification process, you will turn. Oh, I know what I was going to search for. Yeah, hang on, about repenting. Jesus saying you must repent. That's what it was. There we go. We found it. But 
we will go back where we were and finish this up. I have discovered the principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law in my heart. In other words, I love God, you know, chastening me and scourging me and making me do the right thing and beating the world out of me. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. That power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me because he's still in his body. He hasn't received his glorified body yet. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that dominated, that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see how it is in my mind. I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. He's not a slave to those sins we talked about in Galatians because it says, those which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So the God, God will pull you out of that. Okay. But just like we said, all unrighteousness is sin. In other words, anything God wouldn't do, anything Jesus wouldn't do. And there is a sin not unto death. So there you go. There are sins that don't lead to death. There are, there are ours that do. Because when you don't inherit the kingdom, you receive death. There is no in-between. And people try to sell you on that. Well, the kingdom is different than salvation. No. Wrong. They sure have twisted up the Bible uh, in utter perfection. And of course, this passage did say in the King James, it did say outer man or inner man. So for I delight in the law of God after the inward man, which is Christ in you. Okay. Acts 20, 21, testifying both to Jews and Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards Jesus Christ. Um, if you look up the word repent, and we are in the King James results one through 25, suggested result. You go through Genesis. We're in Jeremiah. <clears throat> this will take us through Matthew. From the first time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So, yes, of course you have to repent. People that tell you you don't have to repent. I mean, I lost a relationship over that. <laughs> but how does it go? <clears throat> how does that go? The word of God. The word of God covered. These pictures should match. The word of God divide us on. How does that work? First go. Hold on, I'll key it in. The word of God. Thank you. Because I've searched it so many times. I'm on an empty stomach. My for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, even dividing asunder soul and spirit. So the word of God's going to divide you. And, you know, sadly, she went one way and I went the other. Not sadly for me, but that person's a QAnon follower, a Trump lover. Donald Trump is their profile picture as they stand posing next to Donald Trump. Cardboard cutout. Uh and that person thought that all you had to do was say, I believe, and you're good to go. Dividing us under soul and spirit and the joints of the marrow and the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And so 
And Jesus said, I came not to unite, but to divide. What is that for first? I'll butcher this one again, too. Jesus said, I come not to unite, but to divide. According to Quora, I tell you, no, but rather division. His followers may have assumed that Jesus had come to restore the kingdom of peace. However, Jesus is saying that it's not yet time for that. You suppose I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. Think I not come to send peace on earth? I came not to send peace, but a sword. And the word of God divide us asunder, soul and spirit. The word of God is the sword that divides. So I hope that makes sense. Ye believe me not, because ye are not my sheep. Ordained at the foundation of the world, as I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice. Because why? They're given eyes to see and ears to hear. And I know them. For those who did foreknow, which is the exact opposite of, I never knew you. I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life when, after he beats the world out of them through the chastening and scourging process. And he turns them out of all those deadly sins that we read to you in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, when? At the foundation of the world, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. All right, very good. Thank you all very much. Love you all.